Welcome to the Asia Advantage webinar series on opportunities in emerging Asia. This is Jessica Tao of the Desenshire & Associates U.S. office. I'm here with our company founder, Chris Devonshire Ellis. He is ready to discuss some of the topics from his presentation at the U.S. Commercial Service Hot Market Watch Conference. He will touch on staying compliant in the Chinese and ASEAN markets and review recent regulatory changes, including financial and due diligence issues affecting U.S. companies interested in expanding into China and ASEAN. You will be able to send questions via GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. We'll be answering those questions at the end of our presentation. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening to our guests wherever you are. Uh, my name is Chris Devonshrellis, and I'm the principal of Decent Children Associates. Uh, just briefly on our firm, we've been established since 1992. Uh, we have 12 offices in China, uh, one office in Hong Kong, five in India, two in Vietnam, one in Singapore, and we're speaking to you today from our liaison office in the United States. Our practice uh, is a hybrid firm. We provide legal services related to corporate establishment in these countries due diligence, both legal and financial, uh, tax planning. Uh, we then service our clients once they've become established in these countries through ongoing tax filing, accounting, payroll processing, and audit. Uh, we have in the region about 350 staff. We are members of a global alliance of uh, accountants uh, the Leading Edge Alliance, uh, which is a, an international organization, the collective billing for the LEA last year was 2.7 billion US dollars. Our practice also owns the Asia Briefing Publishing House, which includes titles China Briefing, India Briefing, Vietnam Briefing, and we'll be referring to those during the course of this presentation. I will begin by concentrating on China, and there, as we can see, uh, Tiananmen Gate. China today is changing and it has changed significantly over the last 20 years. Um, the economy is currently out of balance. There has been an over-dependence on export manufacturing, and the Lewisian turning point is kicking in. What is the Lewisian turning point? Arthur Lewis was an Amer American economist who, in 1954, derived an economic theory which is of relevance today and explains a lot of what has been happening in China. Uh, Lewis's theory dictates that if you had a large labor force and that government policies enabled that labor force to work, you would create wealth into society. If that society then reinvested that wealth, you would start to develop a sustainable society and increasingly affluent. That is the point in which China has reached today, the turning point in its economy where it has become sustainably affluent and increasingly so. Twenty years ago, when I first established my practice, uh, the average age of a Chinese worker was 23. Today, the average age of a Chinese worker is 37. And the differences are that at age 23, that guy was interested in having a couple of beers, smoking cigarettes, chasing girls. But at age 37 today, he is now married, has a child, a mortgage, and dependents. He now needs to earn money. And China's policies during this period have ensured that he is getting that money into his pocket to afford these responsibilities. And that is a consequence. This is one of the reasons why China's labor costs have been increasing as have the mandatory welfare costs. So China 20 years ago did not have a middle class to speak of. It couldn't afford to buy overseas goods. Today's China can now afford to buy uh, uh, imported goods. And it's significant to note that news that just came out this morning, US time, uh, from the US-China uh, Business Council 
has indicated that U.S. exports to China in 2011 hit 100 billion U.S. dollars for the first time. This means that the Chinese economy is switching away from low-cost manufacturing and into a globally dynamic consumer market, and this is where a changing China starts to take effect. Those social welfare costs, as I've said, in line with wages, have been increasing. The China labor law has become highly protective. And as a result of these increased costs in China, that cheap export manufacturing, which is where China began 20-odd years ago, is now moving to India and Vietnam. Interestingly, the average age of an Indian worker today is 23 the same as the average age of a Chinese worker 20 years ago. The difference between China and India today is that when China started, it did not have a middle class. India, as it begins its journey along the Lewisian turning point, uh, has an existing middle class uh, about the same size of China's, of around 200 to 250 million people. It's those markets which people now international businesses can now start to sell to. The difference between India and China is that the Chinese middle class is set to expand significantly and increase from about 250 million today to double that by 2020. The Indian middle class by comparison is likely to remain static. Back to China. Uh, we are now seeing, as I've suggested, a recalibration to a consumer-driven economy. The middle class is growing, as I mentioned, and that middle class is now demanding better quality and choices of both products and services. It is increasingly positive for sales of products, and as I've mentioned, the U.S.-China Business Council this morning released a report which is on the China Briefing website uh, that the U.S. has reached $100 billion worth of exports to China for the very first time. Manufacturing in China, the cost dynamics have also changed. What used to be 20 years ago, uh, an emphasis on how much did it cost to manufacture in China, has now shifted to how much does it cost to manufacture and deliver it in good order to me wherever I happen to be. Um, that now includes the costs of goods damaged in transit, the costs of traveling quality control executives, uh, delays in shipping, so a hedging against that means that inventories have had to be increased. Coupled with that, increasing automation in China is reducing, together with the aging population demographic, is reducing the numbers of available Chinese workers. Inflation in China has been a problematic and rising oil prices is also adding to the supply chain cost. Manufacturing in China is also moving upscale uh, and is looking towards uh, generating more innovative inventions and added value products. China is now in the added value business and is getting away from a low-end manufacturing business. So there are changes. In terms of China moving ahead, uh, cities like Shanghai, which has two airports, a maglev, wonderful buildings. There's not so much development space there left apart from selling increasingly expensive consumer products. The growth in China will be in the second, third, and fourth tier cities. The first, second, and third largest cities in provinces are where we're going to see dynamic growth come from China over the next 10 to 20 years. As I mentioned, the population is aging. They are becoming more sophisticated in the products in which they want to buy. However, China is a large country, as we know, and there are implications uh, in terms of ethnicities and culture of where to sell to, the cost of sale, and uh, the localized issues that people have to face. I'm showing you there a picture of a 100 RMB banknote. I don't know if many of you know that there are, in fact, seven languages on a Chinese banknote, including Braille. So six of those languages indicate just the diversity that is in China today, and companies that wish to sell to that market, especially as they get further afield, will need to take into account those differing ethnic details. 
We'll move on to ASEAN. We've got a map there. China fits in the middle between Vietnam and moves up north of the Philippines. But ASEAN itself, uh, which comprises Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, is a very diverse but dynamic uh, area in its own right. There are 600 million people in ASEAN, and its GDP is $1.8 trillion. The interesting thing about ASEAN is that although it is a free trade zone in its own right, ASEAN countries can freely trade with each other, uh, ASEAN as a bloc is expected to sign free trade agreements with China, India, Japan, South Korea and Australasia by next year. This means that it would be possible to manufacture in ASEAN and export to China, India and the other markets which I've mentioned. So ASEAN is starting to become a central focus point for manufacturing and development in Asia. We'll look at the ASEAN demographics. Uh, growth is in Singapore, which is a regional financial hub. Uh, after Hong Kong, it is the second largest trading center for the renminbi. Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines and Thailand are all showing significant signs of growth. Uh, the Philippines is now the destination for the uh, largest amount of outsourcing uh, processing that is going on globally. Vietnam is developing because it is taking away from China uh, manufacturing capacity. Companies are not generally closing down their factories in China due to costs, but if they do wish to expand capacity in China, that capacity expansion is increasingly going to countries like Vietnam where the labor costs and associated production costs are lower. Indonesia is also a significant market of some 220 million people, whereas Thailand, although it has its political issues, seems to be settling down. Its economy is booming as a result of the infrastructure and investment that is now pouring into that country as a result of uh, direct result of last year's floods. There is increased stability in Malaysia and Brunei. There is higher risk growth in Cambodia and Laos, but uh, we have offices in Vietnam and sitting there people are talking to us about even cheaper production costs in Cambodia and Laos. And Cambodia especially is interesting as it does have a port, whereas Laos is landlocked. Burma, Myanmar is largely unknown as an entity. Of course, it remains um, uh, somewhat uh, directed by its military although it did instigate a parliamentary reform last year. The elections are currently underway. Interestingly, Myanmar has just released regulations on freeing up foreign investment into the country, and we have posted the details of this on our 2.6 billion website in terms of loosening restrictions on FDI and introducing significant tax incentives for foreign investment to get into the country. I think that Myanmar may still yet be uh, a high-risk nation, but we'll see if there is sustainable development as and when Burmese state-owned enterprises start to list in regional markets in Bangkok and Singapore. When that happens, I think we can start to feel that Burma, Myanmar is a, uh, is a sustainable market that is well on the way to reform. I talked about the average ages of workers 20 years ago in China. And in India today, the average age of a worker in ASEAN is 24. It is developing, as I said, as a regional center. It has double tax agreements with India and China, and those are being expanded and will become free trade agreements with most of Asia, as I mentioned earlier. This graph, um, which are, is from the American Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, and it asks a, a fairly Simple question, does your company plan to diversify investments or business from China into ASEAN over the next two years? And the overwhelming response was positive to that. Look at ASEAN as a summary. It is the first third largest developing consumer market globally after China and India. As Hong Kong is a service center to China, Singapore is a service center to ASEAN. And as I mentioned, keep mentioning, because it's important, both China and India have double tax agreements with the ASEAN bloc. 
Singapore it would make an excellent regional hub for management and services of the pan-Asia business. In terms of locating our business there, corporate income tax is 17%. That's slightly higher than Hong Kong, which has a CIT rate of 16.5%. There is no tax on dividends. As I mentioned, it is an ideal base for reaching out to China, India, and Asia, while Vietnam, as I mentioned, is competing with China for low-cost manufacturing and is taking capacity away from that country. This uh, wonderful uh, picture uh, demonstrates modern, contemporary India. People always talk to me about India. Chris, it's decrepit, nothing works, it's broken down, it's horrible, lots of poverty, it's a dreadful place. That's an outmoded perspective. This photograph shows the Astrodome, which is a huge helium-filmed balloon which displays laser images and was used to both replay um, sporting events, give scores, other messages at the Delhi Commonwealth Games last year. This represents an image of contemporary India and where that country is going. The view that India is broken, out of date, decrepit, is no longer valid. We'll look at some comparisons. China and India, of course, do have similar population sizes. In fact, India will overtake China in terms of having the largest population sometime around about 2020. Uh, interestingly, they do have a similar size today of middle class between about 200 to 250 million. What I mean by that figure is that these are middle classes, these are middle class numbers that are middle class to Chinese and Indian standards. Of that 200 to 250 million, about 80 million, 80 to 90 million in each country will have middle class standards comparable to that of the United States. So some significant money there. However, India's middle class uh, has been wealthy for many, many years. This is old, traditional money, and their consumer behavior is somewhat different to the new middle-class money that is in China. Indians tend to be far more conservative, uh, save their money, stash it away, whereas the Chinese, with this new money, tend to be more brash and flamboyant in showing their wealth. So in comparing the two consumer markets, there are behavioral differences. As I mentioned, due to the costs of manufacturing increasing in China, we are seeing low-cost manufacturing moving across to India, uh, also Vietnam and elsewhere in Southeast uh, Asia, but India is taking up some of that uh, manufacturing, low-cost manufacturing industry. The worker demographic, as I mentioned, is the same as China was 20 years ago, but that broken infrastructure, um, which is getting better, does exist in places, but that infrastructure is the opportunity. The Indian government uh, require an investment of five trillion dollars over the next ten years to upgrade their infrastructure and they are as a consequence inviting uh, foreign companies to participate in things called public-private partnerships whereby the Indian government will provide half the money, the foreign investor provides the other half. There are tremendous opportunities in India for getting involved with infrastructure product projects, in airport developments, roads, rail, other infrastructure, construction, and as we've all seen the construction India, the construction industry and buildings develop in China, that is now starting to happen in India. If you go to Mumbai, Chennai or many other Indian cities, you will see those huge cranes dotted around the skyline, just as it used to be the case in China up to 10, 5 years ago. Foreign direct reform in India is underway. Markets are being liberalized. It is, of course, a democracy, and a very noisy democracy. There's a lot of debate in India in a way which does not occur in China as a one-party state. But markets are being liberalized. A great example is the liberalization of the single brand retail market in India which for years had been off limits to foreign investors. That was liberalized fully to 100% foreign investment, as an example, last December, which is good news for brands such as Hermes, 
Gucci, Starbucks, and other companies that are in single brand retail. Multi-brand retail remains a restricted industry. You need to have uh, an Indian partner for that, which means that companies such as Walmart and Cara, for example, uh, still have to deal with a local partner. But for single brands, India is very much a dynamic market. The other thing that's interesting about India is that although the tax regime is currently on the high side, significant tax reforms to reduce taxes in India are on the table. As I mentioned, it's a very noisy democracy and there are various structural issues about getting this passed into the legislature. But um, uh, the basic issues are that uh, we expect to see corporate income tax significantly reduce. It's currently 45% and the, uh, the bill on the table is to reduce that to 30%. And individual income tax is also set to significantly reduce. When those tax reforms are passed, um, which may be a two to three year time frame, but when they are passed, that will have a significant impact on the attractiveness of India as a foreign direct investment destination. Made in China, those labels we're so familiar with nowadays will indeed shift to being made in India. And as I mentioned, India has a double tax agreement with ASEAN. Just to summarize regional comparisons, I already mentioned the Hong Kong, China and Singapore ASEAN connection. Uh, Singapore is a great base for taking advantage of the ASEAN region and the DTA it has with China and India and makes an excellent Asian managerial services and marketing base for the rest of Asia. Vietnam, as I mentioned, is taking manufacturing capacity away from China. Both India and China have huge, dynamic and wealthy middle class consumer markets, though China's is expected to expand faster than India's over the next couple of decades. India and Thailand are also developing consumer markets, whereas Cambodia and Bangladesh, I know it's not part of ASEAN, but Bangladesh, stuck between India and China, is also interesting for further reducing costs, and both are looking very interesting, especially for agriculture and the textiles industries in particular. We'll have a look at the uh, brief look at the legalities here. Um, interestingly, uh, both China, India, and Vietnam, from the legal administrative perspective, share a common route. China, of course, and Vietnam are both communist countries, and they took a lot of their legal uh, administrative uh, designs and structures from uh, the Soviet Union. What is little known is that India, after independence from Britain, actually did the same thing. They went to the Soviet Union for a lot of administrative structural advice and took those. So uh, the impact, the, the, up, the end result being that uh, if you're familiar with the corporate structural procedure of the administration process in China, then Vietnam and India are both similar. In Vietnam, uh, which is something which we don't now have in China, although we used to, it is possible to have a BCC, a business cooperation contract, um, which is uh, applicable to projects, which means that if you have a contract for a particular project, you can enter the country with that and then exit when the project comes to through fruition. Uh, that is not something which is now available in China. Beyond that, Vietnamese uh, representative offices are very similar in structure to those of China. You can establish a presence. You're not allowed to invoice, but it provides you with a great marketing or liaison uh, facility in Vietnam to look at other opportunities or indeed indulge in other activities such as quality control and so on and so forth. From then on, foreign-owned enterprises, um, these can be joint stock, limited liability companies or partnerships and the profits are dependent upon the equity division. We also have uh, joint ventures, a full joint venture, similar to China's joint ventures, the cooperative JVs, again, in which profit is dependent upon investment. So to summarize, if you have a contract uh, project in Vietnam, you would use a BCC. If you're looking just to do market research or liaison facilities or QC, then a representative office would be suitable. You can have a foreign-owned enterprise, the Vietnamese equivalent of a Wuthi in China. Uh, that can be 100% foreign-owned, or it can also, interestingly, uh, incorporate a Vietnamese partner. Then you have the full-blown joint ventures, 
uh, which may be pertinent to have a Vietnamese partner that perhaps knows the market better or in certain restricted industries is a mandatory requirement, not dissimilar to China then. India and uh, China, uh, again India allows project offices, so again related to contracts, you can go in, do something, exit once the contract is completed. Uh, liaison offices are the Indian version of representative offices and then we have limited liability companies. Uh, India differs slightly from China in this regard in that the activities of, an, uh, of a limited liability company, an LLC, which can also be wholly owned of course, uh, are uh, divided into two different categories. Those that require Reserve Bank of India approval and those that do not. The RBI approval process, which tends to be for higher value investments or more strategic investments, uh, is uh, relatively uh, straightforward, but it does take time. Um, if you do not require RBI approval, then the procedure to get a business license in India is quick and relatively straightforward. Uh, so what you do in India and how which license applies, the business scope uh, will tell you whether you need to get RBI approval or not. We do have details of which business activities require, the processes to go through if you do, and which business processes do not. Generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, most standard business operations in India will not require RBI approval. The LLCs, the limited liability companies, take the forms of several different uh, entities, wholly foreign and enterprises, joint ventures of course, and I mentioned earlier, public-private partnerships, which are a, a joint venture where a foreign entity will uh, partner with the government, uh, specifically the sort of interest to uh, build, operate, transfer, or high-value infrastructure projects which require significant funding. PPPs are useful because the government will provide up to half of the investment needed, but will also make, uh, uh, has a structure in place to allow the foreign partner to borrow money from Indian banks as part of a percentage of its investment into PPPs. Most PPPs, as I mentioned, are involved in significant infrastructure projects in India and they remain uh, a profitable and dynamic form of investment into India. Many of them also attract significant tax benefits including tax holidays of up to 10 years. So to summarize the cost comparisons, um, well to, to summarize I'm going to go now into the uh, cost comparisons of running a business in China, India and Vietnam and I know that costs vary considerably from business to business but I'm going to give you a, uh, just an exercise and an example. I've taken the Chinese city of Dongguan which is in South China, it's very close to a port, it's uh, between Shenzhen and Guangzhou and it's a huge manufacturing uh, and export manufacturing area in its own right. Um, I've taken the South Indian city, southeast Indian city of Chennai on the coast there and I've also compared that with Ho Chi Minh City uh, on the southeast uh, coast of Vietnam. So I've assumed in all cases that a factory has 300 workers, makes widgets. I've taken into account the cost of local labor and welfare, the cost of land and general operating costs in terms of utilities and so on. This is how those comparisons worked out. Dongguan, uh, you can see 300 workers. I've covered that out, the average wages, the mandatory welfare, the factory rental, and the salary welfare, uh, salary welfare and rent. Uh, to run that factory, the operating costs annually would come out at about 2.6 million US dollars. So that's how much it would cost on average to run that factory in Dongguan. I've also made a note at the bottom because some people may want to terminate their factory. There's been a, uh, a general consensus that getting out of China due to employee termination costs would be an expensive operation. It's not necessarily so. I've looked at the termination costs and how they would impact. To terminate those 300 workers would cost 
just over 600,000 US dollars. So just to put that in there. But Dongguan, we can see, uh, generally speaking, to run a factory of 300 workers uh, would cost someone in the region of 2.6 million US dollars. We can now move to Chennai. The same thing. I've broken it down into the costs for the same factory size, uh, but to compare, the annual costs of running that Chennai business come out at about 350,000 US dollars, which is seven times less expensive than the Dongguan operation. We can compare that with Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. Um, same issue, 300 workers. The mean overheads, salary, welfare, and rental in Ho Chi Minh come out at $650,000 to run that factory, um, three and a half times less expensive than that operation in Dongguan, but slightly more expensive than uh, that operation, similar operation in Chennai. So I think this exercise, although it is a generalization, gives you an indication as to the cost comparisons that now exist between uh, operating a factory in South China, India, and Vietnam. And these are not insignificant differences. We'll look at some practical ASEAN considerations. Um, Singapore is the world's largest port by shipment, which I think tells us a lot about the dynamics of ASEAN as a region. Uh, trade going through there, coming from ASEAN, transshipments. It is number one, just followed closely by Shanghai. I don't think there's much in it in terms of TEUs, but Shanghai uh, just slipped down behind Singapore in 2011. The ASEAN supply chain, of what, which a lot has been written, is not to Chinese standards, but it is improving. And uh, we're seeing evidence of that um, in terms of our clients at Decent Shearer. Uh, we've been in China for 20 years. Um, businesses still want to invest there, and our practice as a result of that grew by 25% last year, uh, an excellent performance we're very proud of. But by comparison, uh, those same manufacturing businesses, clients, coming into India, our India business grew last year by 62%. So we're seeing a significant increase in interest and investment into India. And as a result of that, infrastructure costs, not just in India, but also Vietnam and elsewhere, are improving. Although it's fair to say that it, does, uh, it, does, it will still take some time to get those up to Chinese standards. Land costs, of course, are lower. Uh, across ASEAN and India, but ASEAN does have uh, that worker demographic dividend, that young worker in ASEAN age 23 comparable to India, ASEAN at 24 comparable to India at 23 and China's costs at 37. So we can see where the cost differences are going to be and where that low cost manufacturing uh, dividend is going to see uh, manufacturing start to shift west to Southeast Asia. It's been a lot of talk about human rights issues, um, both in China, ASEAN, and India. Um, we've been doing business for India now in six years, and I see a lot of press about child labor. Uh, I don't see this in the corporate environment. I'm sure it exists with um, uh, very low overhead running local businesses. I'm absolutely certain it exists, and it's something which needs to be stamped out, education will play a, a role. But in corporate India, and indeed in corporate ASEAN and China, I do not see China child labor as, uh, as an issue. And human rights uh, throughout the region is improving. We're seeing evidence of that in what is happening now in uh, Burma. The scope of double tax agreements is increasing. There are now more tax flexibilities arising throughout the region. It's something that American companies in particular should be aware of. Uh, US DTA with Singapore, ASEAN are in the process of being upgraded, and that provides a lot of opportunities for American businesses. US companies should be talking with their accountants, or indeed ourselves, about the impact of American DTA agreements with uh, countries throughout the region. Those consumer markets are opening up as a result of the free trade agreements, which will take effect from 2013. And ASEAN offers both consumer sales for international companies, especially in China, uh, India, and very definitely export manufacturing facilities. 
a suggested regional structure for China, ASEAN, and India, if companies were to move into a regional play there, would be to domicile that head office uh, for Asia in Singapore to look after the management, other services, the tax rate is, uh, is very good. Looking at manufacturing in ASEAN to export throughout ASEAN to China and India, I mentioned the DTA in the free trade agreement several times, with subsidiary factories in China and India to service those local markets. That brings my presentation to a close. I'll just uh, briefly introduce you to other support services that we have. Uh, our Asia Briefing subsidiary at Decentura produces China Briefing, India Briefing, Vietnam Briefing. We're also in Russia and Mongolia. 2.6 billion down at the bottom there. That title refers to the combined populations of China and India and covers emerging Asia. These titles are all uh, three access online. We provide updated daily commentary, regulatory, legal, and ta tax updates on all of these. We also provide a series of uh, regular magazines, books, and other intelligence. If you go to any of these websites, there is a three weekly e-subscription at the top of those websites. You click on that, and we will send you our complimentary weekly update on what is going on throughout the region. Our other supporting materials, especially for what we've been discussing today, China Briefing, India Briefing, Vietnam Briefing, there they all are, China-Briefing, Vietnam-Briefing, India-Briefing, plenty of material there for you to be uh, looking at. Again, a lot of the online content is complimentary for the magazines and books, so please find uh, time to have a look at those if this is uh, uh, something that you're interested in. It is a resource which we provide to try and help international companies understand and develop a presence in these markets. Our firm, uh, 12 offices in China, 2 in Vietnam, 5 in India, 1 in Singapore. Um, I'm speaking to you today from our liaison office in Charlotte in the United States. There's my contact details, chris at deshira.com. Please take time to check out our website. I will now pass you back to Jessica Toe to summarize, and if you have questions, I'll now be able to take those. Thank you. So thank you again for joining us. We'll now be taking questions, so please give me one second as I set the question portion up. Okay, I've got a question here from James Do When will I be coming back to Asia? Um, James, I'm in, um, I'm in Charlotte at the moment. I'm flying to New York tomorrow. Uh, Sunday, I'll be flying to Delhi, um, so back to Asia time zones. I'll be visiting Delhi and Mumbai. Uh, I'll be there for a week, and then I'll be flying possibly via Singapore for a couple of days, but I'll be flying to Hong Kong and then back to uh, China. Uh, I'll be holding meetings in Shanghai and Beijing the second week of April, and then the third week of April I have to depart for Europe. So that's my itinerary. Um, uh, I've got a comment here. I'm excited about opportunities in emerging Asia. Me too. Um, Robert, uh, will slides be made available to the attendees? Um, we won't be making them uh, available to you in, in such a, a, a broad manner but we are recording this presentation uh, with the slides, so we will post that on uh, the, uh, 
the China Briefing uh, website and on the Decent Shearer and Associates website. So you'll be able to see the slides and the commentary at your uh, convenience. So that will be uh, made available for you. Please give us 24 hours to get that online. Um, um, I've got a question here uh, from uh, Keith. Do you see an ASEAN that's more interested in American businesses as a balanced counterweight to an already heavy Chinese presence in the region, either politically or economically? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, as ASEAN nations start to um, become more, uh, uh, more open, I don't actually see um, a desire to attract investment from one particular country over another. Actually, I feel that uh, countries such as Vietnam will be quite as happy as dealing with American investment as they would be Chinese. Uh, the Chinese have a significant presence in ASEAN, of course, because both historically and geographically, they're right next door. So it makes sense that China has uh, a dominant presence in the region, but uh, I do not believe that that is endemic, that China is preferred over other nations. In fact, just taking Vietnam as a case in point, uh, the single largest uh, investor in Vietnam at the moment is Thailand rather than China. Uh, but our views are we deal with uh, multinationals, um, mainly from the West. About half of our own client base comes from the United States, with about 35% coming from Europe and 15% from everywhere else. Um, we, we see significant interest um, to attract American and European investment and Australasian and so on and so forth investment into the region per se. And I don't uh, subscribe to a view that Chinese uh, investment is preferred um, or in, in any way. I believe that all of these economies are delighted to deal with investment from wherever it comes from. So thank you for that. Um, any more thoughts on Burma and its strategic position? Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, but Burma, of course, could be a significant market, um, massive in terms of its population. I think the population there is about uh, 80 to 90 uh, million people. Um, it's really been stagnant since the end of the Second World War for various reasons. Uh, so it's its infrastructure uh, is extremely archaic uh, and there's a lot that would need to be done to develop that. It is early days, um, got to start somewhere. It seems uh, as if the military junta is loosening their grip on the country and that it will slowly move into a more democratic and a parliamentarian system. Uh, elections are currently underway as you are well aware uh, and I think we'll have to just wait and see how serious that move to uh, a more democratic Burma uh, is. Coupled with that, however, the Burmese government did uh, 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 produce a series of um, regulations which have yet to be enacted but are expected to be passed within the next week uh, or so, which add significant tax incentives to foreign investment into the country, including tax breaks, uh, reduction of uh, income tax rates. Uh, they're looking at completely uh, re revising uh, their banking and financial uh, 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 structures. So these are all interesting developments. I think it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, on our 2.6 billion website, uh, we actually have just identified uh, all the different regulatory changes which are, are happening in Burma. I think it's the top article on that site today. So if you have a look at that, I think that article defines what they intend to do. It is early days, and I personally think that a trigger that they're going down this path to reform and that they're serious about it will be when we start to see some of the larger Burmese state-owned enterprises uh, get listed in either the Bangkok or Singapore stock exchanges. I think that's a trigger uh, movement which if happens would indicate that the Burmese government are very serious about reform into the country. So I would wait for that. Um, so thanks Jeff. Um, 
I've got a question from Wendy. Uh, do I see any trend uh, of Chinese enterprises going global? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I've been uh, on a lecturing tour in the United States for the last couple of weeks. I've been to several cities, and um, uh, our partner firms uh, across the U.S. are all saying to me that they have now established a, uh, a client, a Chinese client base. Uh, in their respective cities in the US. So there is uh, inbound investment to the United States coming from China. Um, that tends to be uh, driven by the entrepreneurial sector in China, um, which still needs to uh, develop. Uh, one of the issues that I do have with the general standard of Chinese executives uh, is that 90% um, of China's largest companies are state-owned, either partially or wholly, and that does have a tendency to mean that business decisions within those larger companies tend to become politicized. Um, that tends to hinder the entrepreneurial development of Chinese businesses that are SOEs because they take political considerations first. I don't believe that that's... Um, a particularly positive thing and one of the ongoing reforms that I would like to see the next China government start to put in place is to get the Chinese government out of business and to encourage more entrepreneurs because it does seem to me that uh, business uh, when China businesses go overseas the SOEs um, are government directed at commodities purchasing uh, whereas it's really the entrepreneurs that are making inroads uh, with innovative pro projects, products, bringing those to overseas countries. Um, and they are having a significant impact. America, I can assure you, is extremely welcoming to inbound investment from China. Uh, and it is occurring. But as I mentioned, it tends to be more from the entrepreneurial side. And at the moment, that market does have some limitations because it only accounts for about 10% of China's uh, corporate value. So there's some room for improvements there. Um, thank you. Um, looking uh, at a question here from Daria, do I see any changes or risks, um, let me just get up here, uh, for foreign companies with regards to current political happenings in China? <laughs> um, I presume we're talking about issues concerning Bo Xilai here. Um, I I've been in China for nearly 25 years and I've run a business there for 20. Um, the the Bo Xilai thing I think is in danger of being uh, overrepresented in terms of media speculation. Uh, I think that it is uh, uh, obviously an embarrassing situation for the Chinese government but I think that they have it under control uh, and I do not see that impacting on the change of leadership. The timing of this uh, is somewhat important, is somewhat uh, unfortunate, but I do not believe that the Borshilai issue is really going to have any significant impact upon the change of leadership, and I definitely do not subscribe to the uh, notion that China is any less politically stable as a result of that. You have to take a lot of uh, what media says, particularly about um, politics in China, with a large pinch of salt. If you remember about a year ago, there were rumors that Jiang Zemin had died, um, only for him to appear in extremely good health at a Communist Party conference two weeks later. So there is a huge amount of speculation. I take it all with a pinch of salt, and uh, I do believe that the Chinese political system is robust and does not represent a risk to foreign investors. So thank you for that. Um, we're looking at uh, taking a look north of the ASEAN, a question here from Rick. What do we foresee for Mongolia with its rapidly expanding GDP? Do I see a growing middle class there? Will there be an urbanization move amongst the Mongolian people with fixed housing as opposed to yurts? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, I'm actually an advisor to the Mongolian government, and I was in Ulaanbaatar two weeks ago, the, uh, the Mongolian Economic Forum. Uh, I can assure you that the weather in Charlotte in North Carolina is much better than it was in Ulaanbaatar, where it's minus 30. Um, good question. The um, Mongolia's GDP is uh, rapidly developing. I think it's set to hit about 37% by 
this year, which makes it the fastest uh, growing country in the world. There are problems with that. Um, as a result of the GDP explosion, uh, the uh, Mongolian currency, the Togrig, is also um, the, far, the world's fastest appreciating currency. Um, and that has significant implications as concerns inflation rates, which are going through the roof. Uh, the Mongolian economy generally is really a mining play. Uh, so if there are companies there which are in the mining space, then Mongolia is very definitely somewhere to look at. But it's very early days, and it's all about the big players. So they need to sort out their contracts with government first. Um, Mongolia, for those of you that are interested, has the world's largest reserves of coal, uh, silver, gold, uranium, and a whole host of rare earths and other uh, natural commodities. Um, it is going to be a game changer as where the world goes for its supply of these commodities. Uh, but at the moment, it's very, very undeveloped. Uh, the big players are in there because they have the big pockets to be able to get these materials out of the ground. I think it'll be an, another few years before we start to see the second tier industries coming in there and the suppliers to the big Mongolian companies. I think you're two to three years off that at the moment. But for sure, um, second tier industries supporting the mining industry in Mongolia are going to be needing to have a look at that market now with a view to market entry in two to three years time. I'm aware that the Mongolian government, Mongolia is a huge country but with a small population of three million people, the Mongolian government is very aware, it is a democracy, of its uh, responsibilities to the Mongolian people and that it does intend as Mongolian companies start to list on the Mongolian Stock Exchange and stock exchanges in Hong Kong and London, the Mongolian Stock Exchange has a partnership with the London Stock Exchange, as Mongolian companies start to list on these markets, that the Mongolian government is hiving off a percentage of that listing to give shares in those companies free to Mongolian citizens. Quite how that is going to be implemented remains to be worked out, but the implications are that Mongolian nationals will be sharing in Mongolia's wealth, and of course that is going to have significant impact on the livelihoods of Mongolians. There are many Mongolians who prefer the nomadic life, and I can't say I blame them. It is an incredibly beautiful country. Uh, but it's also true to say that with not many Mongolians, I think you'll start to see uh, a, a very wealthy Mongolian class being created. There's only three million, um, and uh, the country start to import large amounts of uh, labor, uh, perhaps uh, some from China, but increasingly from the rest of uh, Asia. So significant developments in, uh, in Mongolia. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions we've uh, got. I'll just talk to you for another two minutes and see if any others pop up. But otherwise, I hope that this, um, question, this uh, session has been useful to you. We will be putting it up on the China Briefing and Decent Shira websites, both in terms of the slides and my commentary. And uh, uh, please, uh, uh, it'll be there. And if you've got any other uh, questions, uh, then please email me, chris at uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'll let you into a secret. This has been our first ever webinar. So I hope that we did good. Um, but I hope that it's not going to be our last. Thank you very much for spending your time in listening to me talk. Thank you. So thank you again for joining us. I just wanted to finish off to let you guys know that we will be posting our, on our LinkedIn group, Asia Briefing Media, and doesn't share a Twitter feed, some of the questions that you've had and also emailing the answers. Um, visit our website at www.dezshira.com. That's D-E-Z-S-H-I-R-A.com. We are always excited to hear your comments. Email us at, email us at webinar at .com. Thank you again.